morning, everyone. We shall see how long I can get through my sermon today, but <clears throat> I want to start with a question. Do you enjoy praying for others? Do you enjoy it? You know, most Christians find it hard to pray um, because prayer is easy to forget about. We have other things on our mind. But another reason why we have a hard time praying is I think that we find prayer a little bit boring. And there are just many things that we'd rather be doing with our time than something kind of as boring as prayer. Prayer feels often like work to us. And sometimes it feels like this work is not making any difference. Some of us feel like prayer is kind of like getting your room organized. You wholeheartedly agree that it's a good thing to do, that you should do it, but you never seem to get around to doing it. But simply the reason we don't pray that much is because we don't want that much to pray. We want to spend our time doing something else. But God has designed prayer to be so much more than what we imagine. God wants you to pray not because he needs your help with things, but because he wants your joy. <clears throat> God wants us to pray so we might relate with him and get to know him as a person. Prayer takes us where we need to go, to God himself. And so we can cultivate a more joyful relationship with God through prayer. God also wants to give you the joy that comes from serving others in ways that make a difference to them. He wants to give you the joy of seeing your little prayer make a real difference in someone else's life. You want to find joy that lasts in your life? Pray. There is joy to be found in prayer. Now, oftentimes, it's the mature Christians who have been walking with Jesus for decades who are actually able to do this, who are able to find real joy in praying for others. Because through the years, they've come to see that prayer is not so much a duty, but a privilege. And in this way, these older saints set an example for us by their enthusiasm for prayer. So what's the secret here? What's the secret to joyful prayer? I found that joy in prayer comes out of my joy in God in that moment. If I can't find joy in God, then I'm not going to enjoy coming before God in prayer. But if God is who I am enjoying in that particular moment, I am eager to connect with him and to ask him to bless others. And I find joy even in doing this. As I look back in my life at some of those times of really sweet prayer that I've personally had, what made them sweet in that moment was because as I was praying, I was savoring God and worshiping God as I prayed. You see this in the Bible too. When Christians pray, there is this undercurrent of worship. Their prayers in the Bible are centered on God himself, not on themselves, not on their circumstances. And so the very act of praying ends up stoking their joy in God. We can see this here in Paul's prayer in Ephesians chapter 1. Here Paul describes how he prays for his fellow Christians. And as he does this, he models for us how we should pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ. You can hear the passion in Paul's prayer. Paul is worshiping as he prays. <clears throat> He's not falling asleep as he prays. He is becoming captivated. As Paul starts to reflect on God in his prayer, his joy starts to build until it overflows in worship. So today, we're going to try to learn from Paul's example. We're going to consider how we can pray for others, and particularly for those who are already Christians, our brothers and sisters in Christ. And we're going to see how prayer not only blesses others, but it blesses us as we pray. So let's ask God to use this passage to teach us how to pray for others. Heavenly Father, use this word for our good, to bolster our faith, 
to lead us in your path, to show us what is good and right and help us to rejoice in you through your word this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're taking notes, I've got three main points for you. When Paul prays for others, he does three things. First, he thanks God for them. Second, he intercedes for them. And third, he follows up with them. So let's jump right in. First, in verses 15 and 16, Paul thanks God for these brothers and sisters in Christ. He says, for this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. <clears throat> Paul says in his regular times of prayer, Paul would regularly thank God for these believers in Ephesus and in the surrounding areas. Whenever Paul prayed, he would thank God for them. That's what he means here by not ceasing to give thanks for them. It's because gratitude is a really important part of the Christian life. Gratitude is the appropriate response to God's kind and gracious provision in our lives. First, we notice the good in our life or in someone else's life. And then what we're supposed to do is we're supposed to give credit where credit is due. And so we thank God for this kindness that has come into our life or that's come into the life of someone else. There is a small but important difference, though, between saying I'm blessed and saying God has blessed me. Technically, those two sentences can mean the same thing, but the first leaves the source of the blessing undefined. If we just say, I'm blessed. And what happens then is when we say, I'm blessed, it encourages us to focus on the blessing itself. If you say, though, God has blessed me, you are defining and giving credit to the giver, and you're also reminding yourself that that gift, that, that gift and every good and perfect gift comes from him. Small difference, but it's an important difference. <clears throat> it's actually one of the keys to unlocking joy in God. It is good in general to be thankful for what you have. You don't want to be ungrateful. Being thankful will make you more content in life. But if you thank God for those very blessings that you're thankful for, if at Thanksgiving it feels like you are so full of, of gratitude to a God himself, If you see these gifts as gifts that you've done nothing to deserve, you'll not only be more content, but you're going to start to find joy in God and a greater desire to go to him in prayer as a result. So as we go to God in prayer and we ask him to provide, let us remember how God has already provided so much for us in Christ. When God gives to us, we ought to be grateful. Our prayers should have a thankful spirit behind them because God has blessed us so abundantly already as his people. I mean, if someone sends you a gift in the mail, what are you supposed to do? The first time you connect with that person, the first words out of your mouth should be, thank you for the gift. Thanksgiving is what God deserves. It should be our first move as we come to him in prayer because we are so blessed by him. And as we express our gratitude to our God in prayer, it not only gives God glory as we give him credit, but it helps our mind. It helps us direct our mind to focus on the goodness of our God, on the wonders of his provision, how he has come through for us again, just as he has so many times before. Thanksgiving not only helps our prayers to be God-centered, but it starts to awaken our joy in God as we remember his kindness to us. Paul takes his thanksgiving a step further as he prays. He's not talking about thanking God for how God has worked in his life, though I'm sure he did that. Paul's thanking God for how God was working in the lives of other people. He thanks God for these people's Christian faith and their Christian love, which show that they were true believers. When he thinks about their conversion, he doesn't thank them for joining the cause. He's not saying, hey, thanks for signing up. We could use the help. The church is not a pledge drive. 
Paul does not go around complimenting people for making such a good decision to follow Jesus or complimenting them that they work so hard to, to love others. He is so focused on God. He sees these good things in their life as gifts that have come from God. So he gives thanks to God for his work in their life. His prayers are thoroughly centered on the giver. This isn't the only reason why he gives thanks. He says in verse 15, for this reason, the reason he's just talked about, he gives thanks for them. <clears throat> now, for this reason means look back at the previous verses. That's what we've been seeing in our previous times in Ephesians chapter 1, specifically verses 3 to 14. There, Paul, as we saw, shows us the abundant spiritual blessings that God gives to us. And he reminds us that God has given us these blessings, verse 6, to the praise of his glorious grace. He's given them to us for a purpose, to the praise of his glorious grace. God showers us with amazing grace, so we might shower him with praise. So whenever Paul thinks of these believers, he thinks of the glorious grace of God in their life, and he can't help but give God thanks. Let's make this personal. When was the last time you thanked God for his kindness to someone else? Your brothers and sisters have been richly blessed by God. They've been saved by Jesus. They're being transformed by the Holy Spirit in beautiful ways, just as you have. Are your eyes open to that? Are you ready to give God the thanks he deserves? Not just for what he does for you, but what he does for others. When you see the fingerprints of God's grace in someone's life, praise God for the good work that he is doing in them. By doing this, you'll not only give glory to God as you should, but it's going to help your own joy in God to grow. As you reflect on God's kindness to others, you'll be remembering how good he is to you and to all his people, and your heart will start to feast on the riches of his kindness. Your heart will be drawn toward him. And your heart will be drawn toward that person too as you pray for them. Their flaws that annoy you will become less significant to you. And instead, you'll be more focused on the good that God is working in and through them as you pray for them. So thank God for his kindness to others, for his glory, for your joy, and for the sake of your relationship with that brother or sister that you're praying about. Second thing Paul does here is he intercedes. <clears throat> Intercession is when you pray to God on behalf of someone else and ask God to work some good thing in their life. In verses 17 to 19, Paul asked God to do four things for his brothers and sisters in Christ. First, Paul prays that they might know their amazing new father in a deep and powerful way. Verse 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened. In verse 5, Paul argued that God not only accepts us in Christ, despite our sinfulness, but he has adopted us as his children. Now Paul prays that this adoptive relationship would become even more real to God's children, that they might really get to know their amazing new father. Our father is gloriously powerful. He is more powerful than any being that we've ever seen or even that we can imagine. And he is gloriously good. He is far better than any being we've ever, any person we've ever interacted with. Even Jesus himself served and loved the Father. The Father called Jesus his beloved son. And now in Christ, you, Christian, are his beloved son or daughter. You get to approach him in prayer. The God of the universe. And he'll listen to you. You can't approach 
even some of your local officials, let alone the governor or the president, but you can approach the living God himself who created everything. You can approach him in prayer because you are his child and he welcomes you into his presence. We get an opportunity to behold the beauty of our creator in the context of a relationship with him, a relationship where he is providing for us all the time. God has adopted us so we might know him. That's one of the reasons why he adopts us. He wants to have a real father-son, father-daughter relationship with us, a real one. And that's why Paul prays that God's children will get to know him. This is a priority to our father. He wants a deeper relationship with us. So we might find joy in that relationship. He wants us to be happy. And he knows that he is the only one that can really make us happy. <clears throat> the way we come to know our father in a deeper and more powerful way is by coming to see and understand how our father has revealed himself to us in his word. That's why Paul specifically prays that the Holy Spirit would impart wisdom and revelation to them so they might know him. On our own, we are powerless to know God. We can only know God if he reveals himself to us. That's why Paul is asking God to act. He's praying for this. He knows God has already revealed himself to us in the Bible. And now God needs to work by his spirit to shed light on what he has revealed. So we can see what God has written in a new light and grow in our knowledge of God. As we learn to savor more and more facets of our father's glory. And this revelation then gives us wisdom to know how to live in our Father's world. It's the first thing he prays for, that they might know God as their Father in a deeper and more powerful way. Second, <clears throat> Paul intercedes that God would cause these believers to know and to treasure his amazing provision for them in Christ, and especially the future blessings that he still has in store for them. Verse 18. That you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. That's another prayer he's giving. That you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. God has chosen to bless us with the wonders of salvation, even though this cost him his beloved son. God has decided to bless us with an amazing inheritance as his children. Many of these inherited blessings we already can use and enjoy. Every spiritual blessing is already ours in Christ, Paul says in verse 3. God gives us these blessings, as we saw, to the praise of his glorious grace. He wants us to know and to savor this grace. So he doesn't just give us this grace. He gives us the grace. And then he tells us what grace he's given to us. So we might be able to say, wow, I'm so blessed. God is so good to me. He wants us to know his grace and not just to, to experience it. So we might be able to savor his grace in the way that he wants us to. And to savor it to the point that we're so full of joy that we give him praise and glory for his goodness to us. So now Paul prays that these believers would know and experience these blessings he's already talked about in chapter one in a deeper and more powerful way so that they could accomplish God's purpose in their life. So that these believers might be delighted by God's kindness and joyfully praise God for these gifts. <clears throat> But what Paul accents here in verse 18 are specifically the blessings that still lie ahead of these believers in Christ. He's talking about the hope that still awaits us as his people, the hope that will come to us because of Jesus. So let me tell you some of what lies ahead of us in Christ. <clears throat> we will live. <clears throat> if you're a Christian, you and I will live sinlessly and joyfully 
in Christ's physical presence. In the new heavens and the new earth. There we will know God like never before in our life. There we will enjoy God more than we have ever enjoyed anything else in our life. As Paul puts it in 1 Corinthians 13, 12, for now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. Brothers and sisters, the wonders of God await us. Immortality and a pain-free body await us. We will taste the joy of living in perfect and a harmonious community with others. And that will be our experience of community forever. Our glorious hope will not disappoint us in the least. So when a Christian understands that and they can savor the wonders of that inheritance that is theirs in Christ, what happens is they find strength that they need to keep going. Joy even as they suffer because they know where they're headed in its glory. That's why Paul is praying that his brothers and sisters would be able to know and savor their inheritance in Christ. You want to help your brother or sister in your life find joy and strength? in their challenging situation right now where they're suffering, ask God to give them a glimpse of the awesome grace that he is about to pour out upon them. Intercession number three. Paul prays that God might help them grasp their new identity in Christ. Look again at verse 18, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. Now, this sounds just like the last request at first glance, but it's actually quite different. Paul is asking God to help them understand, quote, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. Now, notice Paul does not say the riches of our glorious inheritance as saints. He just prayed for that. He just prayed that these believers would be able to taste the wonders of their inheritance in Christ. But now Paul's asking for something different. Paul is asking God to help them see the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. That is, that they'd be able to see God's glorious inheritance. And what is God's glorious inheritance? The saints. In Christ, we have become God's glorious inheritance. You may remember Paul made this point back in verse 14, but now Paul is praying that his brothers and sisters would be able to understand and appropriate what this means, that they would be able to see who they now are in God's eyes, their new identity in Christ. And that's a great way to pray for your brother and sister in Christ. When you become a Christian, there are some things that tend to radically change in your life, like how you think about and respond to Jesus or how you respond to sins and idols in your life that may have been ruling you for years. Now you repent of those sins instead of excusing them or just embracing them. But at the same time, there are other areas of your life when you become a Christian that may not change at all or seem to change. You'll find that you want to follow Jesus now, but you still veer off Christ's path time and time again. We all understand this about ourselves. So, you know, we, we, we have this new thing about us, this new desire to follow Jesus, and yet we also say, hey, I'm a Christian. I, I don't want to sin but I still sin all the time. I'm not a very good Christian. God must be so disappointed in me. But it's here that we must understand just how radical our salvation really is. We must go back to the gospel 
and view ourselves in the light of the gospel. The reason why God accepts us as Christians, let me be very clear. The reason why God accepts you as a Christian, if you're a Christian, is not because you serve him really well. It is not because you do such a good job avoiding sin. God accepts you because of Jesus. Not because of the quality of your works before you were a Christian or because of the quality of your works after you became a Christian. Through faith in Jesus, Jesus' own perfect righteousness has been transferred to us, just as our awful sinfulness has been transferred to him so that he could pay our debt of sin on the cross. So now, because you and I are in Christ, we are actually saints. We are not simply forgiven. We are holy because we abound with the perfect righteousness of Jesus, which has been transferred to our spiritual bank account. So when the father looks on us as his children, what he sees is someone glorious. He sees a holy saint who is as righteous as Jesus himself. When God looks at you in Christ, he sees someone who is beautiful, someone amazing, some, someone who is his treasured possession, his glorious inheritance, and he finds joy in us. He doesn't look away from us in disgust. He embraces us with joy. And Paul is praying that these believers would be able to see themselves in that light as God's glorious and holy inheritance in Christ. When we fall in sin, sure, we must repent. We need to ask for God's forgiveness. But we must not forget that God is not disgusted with us. Our God does not withhold his affections from us. He is not always looking for us to prove ourselves to him. He doesn't play hard to get. He doesn't look away from us when he sees us if we are in Christ. He delights in us because we are in his son, Jesus. And in Jesus, you are not some insignificant peon in the universe or some vile sinner he detests. You are in Christ, his glorious and holy inheritance, and he delights in you. This is one facet of our new identity in Christ that we need to embrace as believers, especially those of us who struggle to accept ourselves. We are now God's glorious inheritance. We don't often talk about this, but it's, it's here in the Bible, and it's, it's a life-changing thing if you start to really embrace it and think about it. It helps you to see how much you actually matter to God and how radically you've been transformed in God's eyes. Every believer needs to see themselves in the light of the gospel as part of God's glorious inheritance in Christ. So as you pray for your fellow believer, don't just pray for their grandma's cat. Pray that God might show them who they are and whose they are in Christ. Pray that God would impress their new identity in Christ upon them in such a powerful way that they really start to believe that this is now who they are and that they'd start to live out this new identity in their life. Not only will this prayer serve their joy, but it'll stoke your joy too. The more your prayers focus on the amazing ways God has redefined your brothers and sisters in Christ, the more you will rejoice in the glorious new identity God has given to you. That's another facet of God's amazing grace in our life is worthy of our thanks, and is meant to bring us joy. In session number four, Paul prays that his brothers and sisters in Christ might comprehend that the almighty sovereign of the universe is using his infinite power for their good. Verse 19, that you may know what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe? Not only is God's power immeasurably great, but he uses this power toward us for our benefit, promoting our good. God is acting in power to bless us. 
as Paul says in Romans 8, 28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Why do all things work together for the good of the believer? It is not some cosmic, you know, karmic effect. It is because God Almighty is working them sovereignly for our good. In God's sovereign rule of the universe, the eternal king takes care of his children. Now, this is something we also need to understand at a deeper level because it radically changes how we see our circumstances in life. If God is not just a powerful God, but a kind God, a God who is continually using his power to take care of his people like a shepherd. Then even in the most dire circumstances, we can trust that God is looking after us. As the late David Paulison used to say, God is up to something in your life. And he is up to something good. We all know life can be so hard. Whether you're a Christian or not a Christian, life is hard. But what the Christian has, what the non-Christian doesn't, is hope. Just because we have that hope, that's not enough. What we really need is to be able to take hold of that hope. We need to remind ourselves of our hope. We need to remind ourselves what's true, that God is watching over us, that God is at work in our life, that God is up to something good in our life, that God has not abandoned us, but he's looking after us, even when we cannot trace that rainbow through the rain. Your brothers and sisters are struggling with stuff in their life. We're all struggling. So we should be praying for each other. Pray that God would help your brother or sister see and believe that even now in their challenging circumstances, that God is working in power for their good. That he's looking after their needs like a loving parent does day after day after day. These are Paul's four prayers for these believers. They're, if you think about it, quite different from how we often pray. I mean, think about how many of our prayers are really prayers where we are requesting new blessings or better circumstances, right? How many of our prayers are, God, please fix this thing in my life. God, please give me this thing that I want in my life. Not one of Paul's prayers is like that here. In each of his prayers, Paul is asking God to help others enjoy the blessings of the gospel, which are already theirs in Christ. He's asking God to make the good news seem like good news to them, to open their eyes to the wonders of his grace, to help them enjoy every spiritual blessing that is already theirs in Christ, so that their joy in Christ might grow to the praise of his glorious grace. In this way, Paul is teaching us how to pray. He's giving us a model to follow. He's reminding us that we are far more blessed than we understand. And what we need in life is not fundamentally more blessings. It's not fundamentally different circumstances. What we need most of all is greater awareness of and satisfaction in God's amazing grace to us in Christ, in the wonders of his salvation. God has given us an embarrassment of riches in Christ. So much so that we already have all that we need from God to be able to live our lives with joy. But to find that joy, we must see and savor these blessings so that they start to loom large in our minds and feed the flame of joy in our heart. So when you pray for your brother or sister in Christ, don't just pray that God would change their circumstances. Don't just pray that God would take away their sickness or get them a job or send them a, a future spouse. Those are good prayers, of course. But don't neglect to pray for what you know they need and what you know God says he already wants to give to them. So as you pray for those things, also ask God to give them a better understanding of how blessed they are in Christ so that they might find joy in God and respond to him in worship. 
That's the end game. Paul doesn't ask God to give his loved ones an easier life. He asks God to help them see how blessed they are in Christ so that their hearts might be filled with joy that overflows in worship. That's what the Christian life is meant to look like. That's the good life God wants for us, a life of joy, a life of worship. And this should play a, lot, play a large role in how we pray for others. And as we do this, as we pray for God to fill others with joy in the blessings of God's salvation, we'll find that our own hearts will start to rejoice as well as we pray. But if you take a step back, you, you kind of realize in these verses, Paul's prayer ministry doesn't just end here. Because after thanking God for his good work in these brothers and sisters, after asking God to open their eyes to see his amazing provision in Christ, he does a third thing. He follows up with the people he is praying for. Paul not only prays for people, but he tells people he's praying for them. And he tells them what he is praying for for them. So he can encourage them. For Paul, prayer and action go hand in hand. He doesn't just pray that God would care for people. He himself then goes and cares for them too. He doesn't just ask God to reveal his precious blessings to them. He actually goes and tells them about those blessings. It is both. Look at verses 19 and 20 to 23 and consider what Paul is ultimately doing here in these verses. He writes, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named not only in this age but also in the age to come put all things under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Now, what is Paul doing by writing these words in his letter? Well, one thing he's clearly doing is, again, as he so often does, as soon as he starts thinking about God, talking about God, he starts worshiping God and he's like, I can't stop and tell you about all this crazy good stuff over here. Let me talk about this, right? So he's, he's worshiping because his heart is, is getting full of joy as he's thinking about his prayers. But what is he also doing? He is also teaching these very people that he's praying for. He is ministering to them. He is encouraging them by writing a letter to them and telling them these very things. Now, as we'll see later on in the letter, these Christians he's writing to they were anxious about evil spiritual forces. And so here already, Paul is starting to reassure them that Christ is far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, above every name that is named, that Christ is the king of the universe, the father has put all things under Christ's feet. So not only are those evil powers much less powerful than Jesus, they are actually subject to Jesus. Jesus rules over them. He is the king of kings. So if Jesus wants to destroy them, he could destroy them instantly. He is the cosmic king. Nothing can happen in Jesus's universe unless he permits it. And yet, amazingly, this cosmic king is ruling the universe for the good of his church. And what is Paul doing by saying this to them? Essentially, he is illustrating and revealing some of the very points that he has been asking God to reveal to them. He is writing to them to show them the greatness of God's power and to reassure them that God is working through Christ to unleash this awesome power for their good. Prayer and action are meant to go hand in hand. Paul not only prays that these believers would understand the greatness and goodness of God's power, but he writes them a letter about it. He tells them he is praying for them in verses 15 to 19 to encourage them. And then in verses 20 to 23, he actually teaches them the very lesson he has been asking God to reveal to them. So he does not simply serve his neighbor by praying for his neighbor. 
nor does he simply serve his neighbor directly through a personal ministry. He serves his neighbor in both ways. And in both ways, he demonstrates his love for his brothers and sisters in Christ. He not only thanks God for them and prays for them, but he follows up with them personally. So he can become one of the instruments that God uses to answer those very prayers. And he tells us all of this here in this letter so that we might follow his example. So I want to take some time to do this. Soon we're going to leave. We're going to get distracted by other things. It happens every Sunday. So right now, I want to help you worship God. I want to give you a chance to pray for somebody else. Is there a Christian in your life that you know is struggling right now? Maybe they're struggling to obey God. Maybe they're struggling to find joy in their faith. Maybe they're struggling with some challenging circumstances in their life. Let's use Paul's model to pray for that person that God has put into our mind. So let me walk you through that. Close your eyes. And start your prayer by thanking God for his grace in that person's life. What good has God worked in their life? Maybe they were saved from their sins in an amazing way, and now they have a great testimony to share. Maybe you've seen them growing in some of the fruit of the spirit lately. Maybe you've been served by them personally in really helpful ways. Take a moment to thank God for that person and God's work in their life. Now think about how blessed they are in Christ. <clears throat> God wants that person to understand and enjoy all of these wonderful blessings that he gives to them in a more powerful way. First and foremost, they now have a new relationship with God. They are God's child. He is their father. So pray now that they might get to know their father on a deeper and more personal level so that their joy in him might grow. Now pray that God would help them to see just how blessed they are, not only with physical blessings in their life, but with every spiritual blessing in heaven and with even more blessings on the way to them. Ask God to stoke the fire of gratitude in their heart. Now pray that God would help them to understand who they now are as his child. What part of their identity in Christ might they need to see and savor, particularly in this challenging time? Ask God to help them understand some facet of who they now are in Christ and to be able to embrace just that grace that he gives to them, that new identity, whatever they need. I'll give you a moment to think about what they might need to embrace about their new identity in Christ and to present that request to God. Now pray that God would help them to see that he is up to something good in their life. That he'd help them understand that the all-powerful God is working even their challenging circumstances for their good. 
Pray that they'd be able to trust God even more and find peace knowing that God is in control of their life and that he is working for their good. Now close your prayer by praising God for something that he's shown you personally this morning that you're thankful for, that you want to give him praise for. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now let me ask you, are you not encouraged? Are you not now more excited about God and what God is doing? When we pray God-centered prayers like Paul does, our prayers, they don't just bring glory to God. They don't just help the people that we're praying for, but our prayers actually help us to rejoice in God as well. As we pray, we remind ourselves of his great love, of his amazing grace, and this unleashes joy that spills over into worship. When done well, Prayer not only expresses our worship, it fosters our worship by rekindling our joy in Christ. Prayer is also a way that we serve others in love and build them up. So now that you've prayed for that person, I encourage you to reach out to them today or maybe tomorrow and to let them know that you are lifting them up in prayer. Tell them what you're praying for to encourage them and remind them of God's amazing grace in Christ. Shed light on some of God's kindness to them in Christ. Point out the ways that you see God working in them so that they might join you in praising God for his wonderful grace in their life. Seek to become the instrument of grace that God uses in their life to answer your prayers. Serve them in prayer. Serve them in practice for their joy and your joy and the glory of Christ, our Savior. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the privilege that we have to come before you as your children in prayer. To know that you led us into your presence that in a world where we can't get anyone to listen to us, you listen to us patiently as the almighty king and, and you are eager to, to have us come to you and lay our burdens before you and our requests. We, we praise you, God. You are so kind. Your power has not corrupted you. You are all powerful and endlessly good. We praise you, Father. We pray that you'd help us to come to you more and more often for our sake and for others' sake and for your glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.